for this course last year we designed, well it was before last year wasn't it, um, we put together for all our staff um, for the flu pandemic um, in line of training our patients however um, it's very much um, treatment for these COVID patients now um, I don't know whether you've been watching well I'm sure you've been watching the news um, and you've seen them all lined up face down ventilated face down so it's prime treatment for these patients so what we're we looking at when it comes to COVID patients and admissions to critical care so 5% of these patients um, are requiring admission to critical care has anybody crunched any numbers roughly so for Rotherham, it's 60% of people get COVID, 5% of that is about 7,000 people requiring a critical care admission at some point during these next oncoming months. Um, so to try and expand our beds, we're already running into um, recovery theatres um, and obviously the, the entirety of ITU. And I should imagine anywhere they can get any of our equipment. Um, so 40% of these patients that are coming have got comorbid conditions. The high-risk patients that are presenting at the minute are diabetics, cardiovascular disease and asthmatics. And they're tending to be 60 and over, although there are younger people obviously now presenting. Um, their time in critical care is generally between 9 and 12 days. So even when they do get the ventilated bed, they're in it for a little while. So it's not a quick turnaround for these patients. Um, and their main reason for coming in is respiratory support and ventilation. And um, I'm sure you'll be aware on the news they're saying that these patients come in with pneumonia. Um, and I think the majority is actually ARDS. It's just easier to say pneumonia, isn't it? Um, so our normal rate of ARDS in critical care is about 10% of patients. So two thirds of these. So that's a massive increase um, in ARDS that we'll be dealing with. So there's some strategies from the WHO guidelines. Um, the stuff that we generally do with the top. Um, so the, the other one is prone position ventilation. So if in our normal year, we might prone about five patients max. Um, so that's going to dramatically increase for us as well. Um, and recommendations for ECMO beds. Well, there's 26 ECMO beds UK wide. So there's Kind of, we had the rest of the country competing for those, they're kind of out of the picture, really. Um, so they're differing slightly from our normal patients with ARDS because their lung compliance seems to be better um, and pruning is key to going forward. Our normal ventilation strategies for PEEP in our ARDS patients are about 5 to 10 centimetres, and as you can see, these are coming in on almost double, double that. Um, these are just stuff for our ITU staff that we've been through. Um, mortality rates are ranging massively from area to area. Um, and so for you guys that are looking at helping us look after it or are coming into critical care to help us, we are not breaking circuits. We're not changing HEs like we would do normally. Um, and the only thing that we would break the circuit for is the bacterial filter that's going on the expiration valve on the ventilator. Everything else is just literally staying in place. Um, and that's just to stop spread. So what are we looking at with ARDS? So on your right hand side of that diagram, you can see a normal alveoli and on the left is an ARDS alveoli. So it's an inflammatory response um, that basically causes the alveoli to collapse um, and flood with fluid and infiltrates. Um, so when we oxygenate these patients, no matter how much oxygen we chuck at them, we cannot bridge that gap in between. So people help um, push the alveoli back out and try and bridge that gap but um, often they come in so sick and far down that inflammatory process that that gap is too um, large to bridge um, and they end up with a shunt so massive amounts of oxygen and actually low PO2s so our cutoff or our identifying guideline for patients that we're going to prone is generally oxygenation of around 60% with a PO2 of about 8 um, they're also guidelines of early ventilation and partly to stop the aerosolisation of, of COVID itself and um, so all the majority of NIV stuff 
that we have, we can't actually filter what comes out. So the only thing that we can filter with the CPAP coil is we can put the bacteria filter on the expiration valve. Everything else will be aerosolized that we, we put on. So um, early, early intubation um, is what they're advising. Signs and symptoms for early detection. So unexplained tachyopnea, um, we're chugging lots of oxygen and they're not actually um, getting any better. They start getting fatigued and they start presenting with non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. Um, they start to deteriorate and they end up on mechanical ventilation and we do what we can. However, we still end up going up on oxygen and we still persist with a low PO2. So chest x-ray of an ARDS patient, so left hand side is normal x-ray and as you can see on right hand side there's fluid and infiltrates all over, um, a generalised picture of an ARDS. And CT scans, so this is why we prone. Um, so if you look at the te top CT scans, the top two are patients who are actually on their back supine um, in normal positions and on that left hand side you can almost see a fluid level. Um, so what happens when we prone them, which is the bottom picture, it allows us to start ventilating the posterior lung units at the back. It dis redistributes that fluid and it pulls gastric and abdominal contents down off the base of the lung, so it allows us to ventilate the bases better. So pruning is literally just, well, just turning a patient over onto the stomach. Um, and just a way of increasing oxygenation. I wouldn't say it's non-invasive, it's complicated. Um, so there's lots of side effects, but um, the main ones, um, and the ones that we're really concerned around in this session is an increase um, in displaced ET tubes um, is the biggie when we're turning. You know, the stuff we've already gone through with, we're all, and are going through with our staff on the unit to spot other complications. Um, obviously, we turn them face down sometimes they bring up lots of secretions and block the tube off um, and they're requiring much more support from vasopressors just because we're increasing sedation and that kind of thing. So we kind of went through our unit and protocolised it a little bit more um, for our staff um, and it is probably going to come in a little bit uh, with you guys at and um, so our bed space positions, we're always going to put an anaesthetist, um, someone with airway experience at the top. And then um, for the initial um, proning um, sessions, it's generally three and um, two that are going to be critical care staff. And then you guys will be helping us out at four and five um, is just to get them over. So we also did a checklist, so you'll be assisting us with this at the best place um, anyway. So going through a checklist for a pre-move checklist for pruning and actually turning them back as well. So they stay prone for about 16 to 18 hours before we turn them back. Depending on how many staff we've got, um, it may actually be longer um, and we'll just take it from there. Um, so it's things like, things important things like five staff, we need a minimum of five staff, it may be more if you've got a bigger patient, so BMI cut off for um, proning a patient is a BMI of 35, the other thing that you need to have a look as well is how the weight's distributed, if they've got a massive abdomen there is no point in proning them because if we can't get abdominal clearance it's actually not going to be beneficial for them anyway. Um, there are some absolute contraindications, but I very much doubt that these patients are going to turn up with them. It's open abdomens and unstable flat spinal fractures. Um, and then there's a conversation we already need an anaesthetist regarding other things. Um, so things like gases beforehand. So the other important one is a tube ready to reintubate. So if we do dislodge that tube, it's ready there and to go in. So we're not cutting tubes, we're leaving them uncut. Um, because it, they're having to be clamped when we prone and the lens just in there if we cut them. Um, basic stuff like our eye and mouth care, assessing sedation levels and making sure that they've been paralysed. Um, ET tubes um, secured, that we've aspirated NG feed and it's off and any insulin. If they have got a chest drain, it needs clamping and it needs placing with a catheter um, at the bottom of the bed in between the legs. The electrodes need to be taken off 
um, if we flip them and leave them on, they end up with pressure to us um, from being laid face down. <coughs> and then the pillars, we're going to show you where to put them um, on your patients anyway. Okay. Um, Can you put the pillow up, please? Yeah. Okay, on my command, on roll, ready, steady, roll. On my command, when everyone's ready, ready, steady, roll. On my command, ready, steady, roll. Okay, we're going to slide towards Barry and Jill on my command when everyone's ready. Okay, ready, steady, slide. Okay, on my command, roll towards Sharon and Andrea. Ready, steady, roll. Okay, on my command, on slide, ready, steady, slide. Fashion right now. One My command, ready, steady, roll. Okay, ready, steady, roll. Remember that capita. Go ahead. Okay, capita, okay. And look at Lego. So she's quite a slight patient, but um, it's much more difficult when they're a bit bigger. She's also not attached to lines, tubing, or, or half the stuff that our ICU patients. So um, it's just an example of um, Cornish pasty technique where we literally tighten everything up as much as possible in the sheets so that when we turn and nothing moves and nothing comes out. Yes, well, we're going to have a so you can all actually have a go at using the Cornish pasta technique and actually turning the mannequin into pro. So we'll take turns, okay. So, again, like we did on the video, anything that a patient has got so has actually got a doctor in there, you would keep that within uh, the Cornish pasty. So the other thing we've been doing, uh, for those guys that are going to spend a bit of time with us on critical care, we've been angling the bed towards the pumps, especially on our pendants, um, so there's less chance of pulling central lines out um, and any other sort of big lines. Um, we've also been asking so, um, teaching the initiatives to um, clamp tubes stop the ventilator and disconnect, so I appreciate it's not really your job, however, um, if they muck that up, potentially you've got a spray of COVID everywhere um, from patient and from ventilator if you're assisting it. So we, we, although we're going through it with our staff, they're teaching them to recognise that we, we did a scenario upstairs about an hour ago yeah. where they let me disconnect it and not mm -hmm. turn the vent off. Mm -hmm. um, so it's kind of everybody shout to say stop. That's what Dan said yesterday, it's getting into the eye. 
and stopping your ventilators because it's not what you're doing. Yeah, so they're not used to doing no. it, so it's mm -hmm. new, new for them as well. Um, so it, it literally is everybody's shout. If you think they're going to disconnect it, um, like I just don't, and spray everybody, um, then you need to shout and stop them. Uh, and as long as they're aware, that's fine. Um, they, they know. We also put pillows within opacity too, so generally we tend to have one across the chest and if it's a larger person we want to make sure we've got enough abdominal space then we put one across the hips as well. And it's usually the beneath the tissues leading it that will suggest where we put the pillows and again they stay within the pasty. Okay, so what we'll do, get the two sheets together. Okay, and then roll them as tight as you can towards the patient. The tighter the better, the less likely things are to move around. You're often finding you gripping the bottom of the pillow as well with it, it's fine. Um, it's it's exactly just, it just keeps it absolutely yeah. solid. So um, it's anaesthetic led, so we don't do anything until they tell us to. Um, obviously they've got a tube um, and head down. So what we're going to do first off, we've been teaching them to slide towards lines to stop us actually accidentally removing anything. So we're going to slide to the right hand side and then they're going to clamp, stop the vent and disconnect and then we're going to go on a side. When you're on your side, you lot are going to have to swap your hands over. So bottom come to top, top go to bottom. Otherwise, I know they did it in one, but actually in real life on a heavier patient, that patient just flopped mm -hmm. on the front um, and it makes it harder. Um, to keep her out with. So, on my command to the right hand side, ready, steady. Okay. <sighs> and these disc clamps, stop the ventilator, disconnect. He drops everything. On my command, we're going to turn, ready, steady, turn, change hands. So it's the same on the return, you don't let them um, take the um, clamps off until they're reconnected to the ventilator and restart it because you're in the same, same position as you will be. Once the patient's actually in the prone position, that doesn't mean to say, oh great, we've done it, walk away. Um, because we're having to clamp the tubes as we turn them, so more likely than not, the patients are going to be desaturating. So we need to stay um, in situ until an anaesthetic person who is in charge of the procedure is happy that the patient's stable. Um, because if they're not stable, we may need to turn them back into supine. Um, also, that's why we don't, even on the video, they show that they took the slipper sheet out straight away. We leave it in for a few minutes until we're actually happy that the patient's okay and supine before we take it out, because again, we're going to need it to turn back into where the supine should we need to. Okay. So we'll do the return, if you like. So it's exactly the same. Roll the sheets together. It's Okay, so first off we're going to slide to this side this time. If we actually turn the other way, you end up in an absolute knot with ease. Um, so we're going to slide this way and then we're going to turn up and back. Um, so we'll slide to the side and then I'll do the clamp and everything else. So ready, steady, slide. Really make it hard. Um, stop the ventilator, disconnect, covered. So ready, steady, what hands, yeah. ready, steady, turn, and again the same thing, um, we wouldn't walk away as soon as we turn the patient, actually the patient turning from prone to supine is more likely to arrest in this situation uh, just because of the way the fluid distribution um, is, so um, the chances are, even though back in supine, it's not always going to be straightforward. So again, we need to stay in situ until anaesthetics are happy. Okay. 